Hello everyone and welcome back to The Geek Wave. This is the low budget show. It's the show so low it has no budget. It is also the protector of Kun Lung, the immortal Iron Fist. We're doing it. This is one of the ones I've been thinking about doing for a while because I want I want to talk about this character in a larger capacity and it's just the right time to do it because there's never a wrong time and there's never a right time so we're just going to do it. We do have some really important news pieces to talk about before we get into the big topic because things are kind of falling apart in our world of entertainment. Things are uh, collapsing in on themselves in some scary big ways. We could see a couple things just working out fine, and that's kind of cool. We, we like that. Don't be surprised if the world falls apart in terms of your entertainment. And that's what we have to talk about a bit. I took a week off because I didn't want to talk about the writer's strike because it was terrifying and it's still terrifying to me. And I'm kind of like, oh man, things are getting intense again. And like Zaslav's being a little dick about everything, so I, 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 I like I don't know what what do I really have to say that hasn't been said already? Well, it looks like another legacy union for Hollywood is set to take a stance on all these events happening because the SAG AFRA, the Screen Actors Guild, and everything involved with them, they are voting they're authorizing the vote which is the first step for them in authorizing a strike which is a this is a huge deal if this thing goes through which it probably will because you've seen unanimously across the board people in support of sag for doing this thing so let's hope this gets something right and, and we can see things correcting themselves eventually this is terrifying news, nonetheless. This could be like the Screen Actors and the Writers Guilds both on strike, meaning a huge halt in production on a lot more properties than you'd be expecting. And that's kind of terrifying to think about. But it's also like a key factor that if it, it works out perfectly, they could potentially be siding themselves with the WGA to get everything back on track. Because you've been seeing reports lately of actors, not just like in an online community, but like in actual productions going to streaming. The residuals aren't the same. The production you're making isn't the same. Which is something that was always going to happen. The way that the current like landscape has shifted, there was always going to be like that new like thing being built where things are going to start to change. And this is just the first step of that. So it is scary and it's kind of kind of intense to see what's going to happen. But the, the right thing will win out in the end, hopefully. Uh, and I will support anything that a talent does. If the writers need to strike, if the actors need to strike... I'm all for that if it means they get more pay and better content comes out after it. That's really cool. On top of all that, too, you just saw that like Disney Hulu just purged a bunch of their stuff from their streaming platform, which does feel like a revolt against having to pay residuals for shows they don't want to. So they're, it, it's like the stuff that they have that isn't like the big show from Marvel or Star Wars or or Pixar, or any of that, those feel safe. It's like the other things that can be purged. And that sucks even more. So this is terrifying. I'll always support a strike. I, I say strike all you want. Knock the cards down. And I will be supporting anything that happens here. It's just really, really intense to see this is what we've come to. It was bound to happen. It's better to happen now than, I guess there's no good time for it to happen, but this is the time of action. To see it played out in real time is good, and it could change the landscape of television yet again. This could bring us back to more prime cable network stuff, because even on that note, you've seen things in like the primetime scope becoming bigger than what people are talking about. There's like the whole good doctor thing that ran that went around recently where people are realizing that the show that nobody talks about online is being watched by like 15 million people every week. Yeah, it, it's insane how that's happening. Why do you think young Sheldon's on like season seven? Because these things are working and those actors I'm sure are getting paid 
a little bit better in the residuals than, you know, somebody that, let's just say, worked on a Paramount Plus original, worked on a Hulu original, and has the ability for those to be wiped out completely. This is all scary stuff. So let's go SAG, let's go WGA, let's knock this back where we need it to be. We could all use a big reset in terms of what Hollywood does. So I'm here for that completely. Let's do that. But that's not the only piece of news we have to talk about. There's a couple of things that are worth mentioning. Now that we got like the scary stuff out of the way, let's talk about stuff that's kind of exciting. We had our first teaser trailer for the Five Nights at Freddy's movie. And I've been following the progress of this for a while now. I, I remember just being like, that's a great idea for a movie. We're in the perfect era for that, of like the nicheness of like just found footage, kind of like back rooms movies coming into fruition perfect era for this the trailer creepy it has like a vintage 80s commercial it plays like some classic music it looks terrifying and fun and i absolutely adore every second of it it looks like it's scary and the turnaround on this thing was immaculate it feels like it just like wrapped filming and already it's coming out this year that's pretty impressive you know that leads me to think that this studio has faith in it that Blumhouse is like we made something special with this movie this could be our big ticket and they have a lot of big tickets but this is like the perfect franchise to do a big ticket thing for and it looks fun and the animatronics looked fun the characters looked fun we're doing it we're getting a Five Nights at Freddy's movie and I can only imagine after the success of this movie because it will be successful I have no doubt in my mind that this movie is going to rule October when it comes out. It's going to rule Halloween. They're releasing it at the perfect time. I have no doubt in my mind that it's going to take over all of this stuff and become one of the biggest franchises in terms of movies. It has that potential, and I think it will do that immensely. So that's really cool. We also had another trailer to talk about, this one in the form of Tom Cruise jumping off the side of a cliff because it is time for Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 to get a trailer. Did we have a trailer for this already? Like They pushed it back enough where I honestly can't remember if we had a trailer for this before or not. This looks so good. This, like... The thing is, and I know it's such a cliche thing to say now, but we don't have anybody doing it like Tom Cruise. Like, this guy, love him or hate him, is willing to put in the effort and time to give you a cinematic experience that is just authentic and cool and looks awesome and feels dope. And you just cry and you're smiling and it's like, this is what movies used to be all the time. And this isn't me being like, man, the, the climate has changed. It has, but it's like, you cannot see another movie that's doing what he's doing. You can't see another actor that's doing what he's doing, regardless of what you feel about him. It's insane. And what I love the most about this is that he's he's showing you that he's aged enough, if that makes sense. Like, I think you really feel in this trailer... He is, like, nearing the end of his ride. Like, this is almost, like, not the swan song of his career, but this is, like, the last effort for him to show you, like, I'm going all out on this. This is where my ride ends. I think that's a really cool thing to see. I also really like the effects. I like the actors in this. I really like how we have so many beautiful women on screen here. Vanessa Kirby, Haley Atwell, Rebecca Ferguson, and he ain't kissing any of them, really. Like, they're kind of flirty sometimes, kind of romantic-y at times, but we're not doing, like, a straight-up, look at us, we're together, having a great time. Sometimes he'll be kissy with some of them, but he's just like, no, I'm just going to partner myself with great women, we're going to do some cool action sequences, and we're going to make a lot of money. I respect him for that. I still think this is going to do Top Gun Maverick levels. I do think this movie's going to, like, just be the blockbuster of the summer it has all the ink it has all the inklings to do that and i think it's going to just knock our socks off in terms of everything which is great because i really like maverick it's a really strong movie it's a lot of just people in planes and that's awesome to see too but sometimes you just want to see a 60 year old man drive off the side of a cliff and that's what this movie's going to give us and i think that is really sick and really important and makes me really happy. <laughs>
Give me all of it. Give me everything of that. It's going to be really cool. That is not all the news we have, folks, because there's a mo- like this. This movie was announced a while ago. I haven't talked about it yet, so let's talk about it now. Do you remember the film Twister from when was the original Twister? Like the '90s, I think. I remember like the only thing I really like remember about it is like there's the big ride you can do at Universal about it. And it's like, here's the simulation of a tornado coming through. Remember that was like the thing you could do where it's like the scariest thing about this movie is there's a bunch of water that falls on you and you can make a lot of money. But Twister made a lot of money. Like, was it? It was like half a billion, wasn't it? It was close to that. It got Oscar noms for visual effects. I know it did that. And it was like the biggest movie for a time. Well, It's getting a sequel, (laughs) because why not? Everything at some point gets a sequel. It's bound to happen. We're not allowed to let it live. So that that was announced like last year, and Lee Isaac Chung has been announced as the director, and he worked on Minari, which is a really cool, really beautiful movie. It looks great. So this movie is set to come out next year. So I guess in between that time, I will talk about the first Twister because it's a interesting piece of film history that nobody really talks about. It was a huge movie, and it was just like, this guy is chasing a tornado. It's so weird. But on top of that, we do have a cast to talk about for this movie. And this is where I'm like, oh, this is a, like an actual idea being presented here. Like somebody had a pitch for a Twisters movie or like a tornado movie and they turn it into Twisters. It's very interesting because this cast is unreal. You have Daisy Edgar Jones as, I guess, the female lead who is a, an up-and-comer who's going to just take this world by storm and do something great. She's going to knock the socks off of that. That's really fun. And also Glenn Powell, who has been having a tremendous resurgence with the things he's been working on. He will be the male lead, which, you know what? If I were to pick like a modern Bill Paxton, I don't think there's anyone closer than Glenn Powell. I think he's definitely can pull off like the the sarcasm, like the charm, like the wit. I think he's got it. So that's a really good get. But that's not all. We also have Anthony Ramos in this, and he's up and coming too, so that's really cool. Brandon Perea, who is from Nope, who did Phenomenal. Nope, that's really cool to see that he's joined the cast. Daryl McCormick, which is another, another great get. And that's not all. We have a bunch more people joining the cast for this movie. Moira Turney, cool. Harry Hannon Patton, cool. Sasha Lane, cool. Kiernan Shipka, cool yeah she's she is just waiting to be in a big movie so yeah that makes a lot of sense nick du dudani i'm not too familiar with their work but awesome david cornsweet who is going to be superman probably he's he's gonna be in that makes sense if it's like on a farm he looks like a farm boy tundi adabimpe Not too familiar, but that's cool. And Katie O'Brien, again, kind of in like the Shipka range where now that she's popping, she's going to be popping hard. That's going to be sick. I like this cast a lot. It sounds really good. And I think it's going to be really fun. So that's, that's very exciting. Again, like we don't necessarily need a Twister sequel, but if you're going to give us one, this is how I'd like to see it presented. So that's really exciting. Now we have one more piece of news to talk about, and this is something that I personally really like because it's talking about somebody I'm a huge fan of. Now, two things we have to talk about with Mae Kalamawe, who is a phenomenal actress who was on like uh, Rami for a bit and is in Moon Knight as the Scarlet Scarab. She is, she's going to be blowing up too. Like I think she is about to have a tremendous career take off in some really cool directions. It was kind of like announced as like a rumor that Marvel has like a lot of plans for her. Like, we're going to push Layla into some big directions because she's more interesting than what we did with Mark and Steven. I'll say that. I'll say it. What they did with Layla, more interesting than the stuff they did with Mark and Steven. She was great. 
And there's so many places you could put her. You could build an entire like international team around her. You could throw her on like a Thunderbolts team. You could put her in any situation really and have something work to that capacity. And if we're going to be dealing with like Kang the Conqueror and there's the Rama Tut variant, she is kind of an export on like Egyptian mythology. So she could play a big part there. Throw her on, throw her on the Avengers Make an Avengers international team. She leads it. Whatever. I, I mean, just do something with her. That's really cool too. And if that wasn't exciting enough, this potential rumor that Layla is going to be a big deal, this really excited me. That she will be joining the cast of Gladiator Two, Ridley Scott's sequel to Gladiator. Another one where you're like, I guess you have something to say. Twenty years later, you could talk about. She is joining the cast in what is supposedly a big role, which is so cool. That is so exciting. Like, of course, of course, if we need like a young, hot actress to be in this movie, why not get somebody who isn't going to like distract from the leads? You're going to recognize her like, oh, that's the girl from this. And you'd be like, oh, she plays great off of Mezcal. I think. And again, we see nothing about this. We know nothing about this. I'm calling it now. This is going to be her award-nominated performance. I'm call. I am calling my shot right now that Mae Kalamawe will be nominated for her performance in Gladiator 2. I'm calling it. There's no way she's not going to crush it. I. She's phenomenal, and she's so fun, and I love her to death. And this is going to be a great opportunity that I cannot wait to see what's going to come from it. I have been mixed on the idea of like a gladiator sequel but paul mescal may kalamangwe you had barry kyogen for a minute but he had to back out you're getting all the talent i like and that's very exciting i hope this works out because it could be really cool we could be seeing a mescal and kalamangwe oscar sweep i know that's a big if but whew, that'd be something else so she's about to pop off hard i cannot wait to see what that's gonna look like We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, it's going to be a couple years until the gates of Kunlung open, but we're going to step inside and talk about one of my favorite characters in Marvel Comics. A few months back, I did a video talking about Janet Van Dyne, one of my favorite characters in Marvel Comics, somebody who I think has been underutilized in modern continuity when it comes to things at Marvel. Mainly because of just, like, the MCU destroying what that character means, and we've been promoting different sides of the Wasp universe. But there's another character in Marvel who I have always been a fan of since I was first introduced to them. And they have maintained a special place in my heart as being, like, one of those characters that I can always, like, go back to and be like, yeah, this is something special. This is, like, a cool concept. And it comes from just like such a weird place of Marvel. And there's so many different ideas to talk about when it comes to Danny Rand. And I specifically want to talk about Danny Rand. Well, the identity of Iron Fist has been held by other characters and is currently held by other characters. What I want to focus on is the legacy of Danny Rand in the Marvel Comics universe because there is something to explore there. I do kind of briefly want to talk about the show too and all of that aspect, but this was like one of those characters that was mine. You know, when this stuff started to be popular and it was popular when I was growing up and I was getting like into talking about these things and reading these things weekly, Iron Fish is one of those characters that I could claim as my own because nobody else was talking about him. He wasn't obscure. Conk fans knew about him, but, like, the larger public wasn't like, oh, yeah, I like that guy. They were just like, I don't know what you're talking about. That's weird. That's how I felt about Moon Knight. Moon Knight has now become something I share of the world, which has been a really cool thing to experience, too. I'd like to have that feeling for Danny at some point. I don't know if we'll ever get there. But to me, like, Danny was, like, the one character that truly felt... And it's, like, one of, like, the few characters left when I was, like, young reading Marvel that still truly feels like I don't have to share him with, like, the larger public. I don't have to talk to just friends or family that casually mention Marvel stuff and be like, hey, so what are your thoughts on the Iron Fist show? What are your thoughts on, like, the new rumors for Iron Fist and stuff like that? 
it's kind of like nice to have that feeling just being like this is still like my thing i have talked about a lot of iron fist comic books on this channel i just enjoy reading the character still because the thing i really like about danny and the thing i really like about the iron fist character is just how he is portrayed to the larger marvel universe and this is something that i really connected to when i was younger and something i still connect to with him is just this like kind of like go with the wind approach to everything it's like the wind's blowing this way that's the way i'm gonna go he's always on the right side of thought and, and like doing the right thing but he's also not like you know outlandish or loud or bombastic about it especially for being a guy who is like wearing an insane costume he's very quiet and in his own head while still maintaining something that makes him fun I really respond to that. He is the perfect vibe for like a character that I, I always call like like your California surfer dude where like you could easily see him hanging 10 on the water just surfing down while just maintaining that smile even though he understands like the political aspirations of the world around him. He's always just perfectly comfortable in any situation and can find the goodness in a situation, can find the heart of any situation. He has a lot of the Oliver Queen approach to things where it's like, you. Can, Oliver Queen's a little more like extreme in some of the things he, he does. Might call people out for his shit more. But it's that idea of like, you know what's right and wrong. You're going to understand that. And you have this approach of like how to spread your wealth as like this elitist white male. And that's something I really appreciate about Danny. Like he has always just been the upper echelons of society but he's back down wearing sandals and playing hacky sack on the beach that is like the vibe he gives off and i really do like that vibe and that energy and what really works for that character too is when you pair that up with the hard traveling heroes of the marvel universe which was power man and iron fist the heroes for hire that again this is something i have been saying i have been saying for years and something i wholeheartedly believe fully in my heart if there is one street level comic book that should always be published by marvel it should be power man and iron fist because that is the book that is the story that you use to talk about the times we live in are you telling me we couldn't like there was that brief moment where we were going to release that luke cage book post the george floyd death talking about like a city on fire but Marvel got scared and like they changed the plans for what Luke Cage was doing because a bigger writer was doing something with it. You should always have a Heroes for Hire book with Luke and Danny talking about the problems of today's society because both of those characters have different opinions on it. Luke is invoking change. He's fighting for it. He's calling people out on their bullshit. And Danny is also like maybe not sure of that bullshit, but has the power to change it. They are a perfect duo, one of the best duos in Marvel Comics history. They are perfect together, the perfect pairing. You have the jaded ex-criminal who is just looking for some sort of just like stability in his life and you have the zen calm dude who isn't going to get angry you have the loud angry personality with the calm and collected personality and they just mash together perfectly the other thing about those characters that really stick true and this is i think this is kind of like why a lot of modern stuff with them hasn't till really like formed into something that's cohesive and has everybody talking about it is they are so of the era that they were made they have this energy of characters created in the 70s danny in particular well luke of course is like a black exploitation character but danny is just like we want to make a martial artist character but we also like don't want to make an Asian lead. So we're going to do like the cultural appropriation thing. And Danny's just going to be like the white savior. And, and okay, I do want to talk about that. It's something that I always see people talk about. And one of the current things that is being done with in the Danny Rand comic books and in Iron Fist in general is Danny Rand has the white savior complex to the people of Kun Lung. I, I I get those criticisms. I can definitely see how you look at that and see the problem with it. Now, as somebody who has essentially read 
every Iron Fist story, and there are times where it's done better than others, but I've never saw it as, like, the, the white savior coming in to fix, like, this Asian culture. It's always read to me as, like, it's the culture that saves him, because when he goes to Kunlung for the first time, he has lost both of his parents, he is a lost child with nowhere to go, and he is accepted into this culture that has no need for him and he thrives in it and he finds his place in that it, it, it's never been like he comes in and takes their power and he's going to protect them he comes in they accept him for who he is and suddenly he is a part of their team and he feels happy there and connected there and they do play with that theme a lot especially when you get into like like steel serpent when he's like you took the thing i was supposed to have from me but the thing is, too, Kun Lung also has that kind of, like, worldly, anybody-could-be-anything type of vibe. And when we deal more to, like, the mysticism with the character, we are able to try new and exciting things with him. We're able to see him grow and attempt new creative ideas, which is really fun. And, and it still always stays true to, like, the martial artist thing, where Danny is, like, the street-level character. He is built on the street-level character persona, but he has this ability to go larger than life when you need to. If you have read a lot of, like, current... Iron Fist, or like more modern up to, I, I would say since uh, like the Brubaker stuff with like the immortal Iron Fist onwards, it's a lot more of just like there's a magical world that the realms are hiding and we have big fights with dragons and these other creatures that just appear and these people are also different protectors. And that's a great way to expand his mythology and do stuff with him and do creative stuff with him. It's really cool to see that. But it never to again maybe because like he was a character I connected to and I I I know there are faults in him but I also accept what those faults are as a character. I never saw it as like the white savior coming in to protect them, because Kun Lung has its protectors. There's the Thunderer. There's oh man I don't have the list in front of me of like all the supporting characters in the Kun Lung universe, but there are a lot of people who are based in Kun Lung who are there to protect it. He goes back to New York and becomes like a hero who's rich and helps people in every capacity. That's kind of cool. And just on like a straightforward story level, how badass is it that this guy shows up to like a magical land, plunges his fist into the heart of a dragon and is gifted the power of the iron fist, which makes his hand glow and he can use it to break things, and it's like, this is just a, a living weapon, and he's just strong and intense and crazy, and it's like, he teams up with a man of unbreakable skin, he's got an unbreakable fist, this guy's got unbreakable skin, and they help the little man, it's like, that is so cool, that works so well, and you know what, you know what, I'm just gonna say it, I think he has one of my favorite costumes in all of Marvel Comics, I talked about this when I talked about Janet Van Dyne, I love characters who have a plethora of costumes and they just look like they're insane. Every Iron Fist costume just, they just work. They're just so simple. I really, of course, like the 70s look where it's just the big collar, the, the big shoes, the huge belt. It just looks so goofy and it is so fun and everything about it just works so well. It's, and he's just got like a huge dragon tattoo on his chest and he's just got a stupid mask that has stupid bandana on it. It is just goofy and dumb and it works so well. And we, we just nailed it. And every iteration of it, whether it's like gold or beige or white or a darker green or he's wearing a full body suit, we never lose the, the mask. Like that is the key to the character. We never lose the symbol. Like, you, you nailed it. You just have to have the mask and the symbol, and you nailed that character. And no matter what you do with him, you got it perfect. It's so rare that that happens. That you just nail it that early on, and it, it just stays that way forever. It's really exciting. And it makes me smile a lot. And I just, I just kind of want to see this character find a place in the larger Marvel Universe currently. You know, we have, like, these big stories going on of street-level characters. Like, we have something with Daredevil that's really intense, and we have something with Punisher that's really intense, and we're doing stuff with Thunderbolts and Hawkeye and Luke Cage. But between all that, Danny has kind of fallen to the wayside, and I, I do understand why that is happening. 
it's like now these things are being brought up to like oh we 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 shouldn't have this character that is appropriating culture but he's not really like appropriating culture because you could go into like any any community and you could find a caucasian person who knows the influence of like 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 asian culture and all that stuff and i'm not trying to defend it that way i just feel like the first example is oh he's a martial arts guy who studied martial arts in like an asian community he should be he shouldn't be white is the first reaction and, and it becomes a problem. We'll talk about why that became a problem later on here. But the thing with that is like, well, you can be anything and study martial arts. So why does that matter? Danny Rand. Now, Iron Fist, I think, could be anybody. I'm fine with that. We have seen history, both present and in the past, where other people of different ethnicities have been Iron Fist. Here's my thing when it comes to Danny Rand himself and something I've always said about if you're going to recast for the MCU, here's the thing you need to get right. He he has to be Caucasian. You don't have to make Danny Rand Iron Fist in the MCU if you don't want to. I would like it, but I understand why you wouldn't. Danny Rand shouldn't be played by an Asian actor. He should be a white actor because his story is about being the outsider in this land and becoming the person in this land who has to protect them. That could be done fine with like an Asian actor, but there is so much more power and gravitas to it. If we see like the Steel Serpents, like Davos in that world and the Thunderer in that world and all the other people in Kunlung, looking at this kid, waiting for him to fail. If they're expecting this guy to not have it, to not do it, to not make the power known, if he fails, that is what people are expecting. And when he doesn't, that is the most impressive thing. So I I do think he should be Caucasian in the movies. If you want to do it, you could do Lin Lai, which is... So I guess we could talk about Lin Lai now. Then we'll kind of go through like the more of like the history of the character and what's kind of going on with him. Lin Lai is the current Iron Fist. If you have read the last Iron Fist arc, it was like five issues. Danny, well, there's actually two, okay, two things happen. We had, yeah, okay, let's talk about this now. Then we'll kind of like go back to other like key moments in Iron Fist history. The thing was, we had Iron Fist Heart of the Dragon, which was. All of the magical dragons across the kingdoms of heaven, they're dying. And at the end of that story, Shao Lao is reborn and Danny doesn't accept his gift for the chi. He, he says no, he doesn't want it. So currently he is not the Iron Fist anymore. He is just Danny Rand. Okay. Then we have a new book by Alyssa Wong, who's like, well, I have an idea for an Iron Fist, but I'm also not wanting to write like a white guy getting the power back, which is just fine. That is the other thing I always tell people about Danny Rand is he's not going to be like, you took my power. I need it back to be whole. He's still an expert martial artist. He is still has an entirely huge history of being this badass guy. He's just like, fine. I don't have it. I've been training this young girl pay to take it over anyways. If she takes it, fine by me. I'm fine with that whatsoever. The power goes to the sword master. Sword master? Yeah. Sword master. Lin Lai. He was one of like the new generation of characters created in that vacuum. The thing about him is like Lin Lai already has his own specialty. Lin Lai has his own ability because he is the swords master. So he has his own sword he can control, but the sword breaks, it gets stuck in his body, and Shao Lao's like, well, why don't you take my Xi and help you heal it? So currently, this kid who doesn't want to be Iron Fist is Iron Fist, and Danny is just like, yeah, okay. I mean, that's fine. I I have no problem with that. You got to go do you, kid, and this is currently what you're doing. So you, you go ahead and have that moment. Now, the book wholeheartedly feels like a reaction to oh we have to change the character if we're going to put him into the movies again because nobody wants to see Danny Rand do the thing which I guess does lead me to the the topic that worried me for a long time when I talk about Iron Fist and that is the cultural perception being the Netflix show now that era was so interesting to me it doesn't hold up in my opinion 
none of it holds up well when you really think about it. Jessica Jones is still like my favorite show of that era. And it's such a unique thing to see that that actually worked. I did kind of talk about Iron Fist before in that capacity. But what I really want to like focus on now is like the cultural perception that came from Danny Rand in that show. Because it kind of ruined it. I do think there is a huge like duality between what the comics do and what the larger than life movies and television are trying to do. So when those clash and they they do a bunch, it happens more often than you're thinking. It does noticeably change how you view a character. So you have Danny Rand get a TV show with a actor who is perfect for the role. I don't care what anybody says. I don't. I think Finn Jones was the perfect choice for Danny Rand. I look at that guy and I'm like, he's got the smile. He's got the hair. He's got the body. He is perfect. The problem with that show and what it did was it didn't trust in Danny Rand enough to be the white savior it tried to make him like this dupey guy who just shows back up and is kind of homeless i like the idea that he's homeless that's kind of a funny concept to play with but they just didn't trust the show enough and, and believe in the character enough to have it be like a naturalistic thing i do think he is good i do think he is fun and they just didn't write him good. And they didn't let him train good. So the thing that happened was the culture's like, oh, this is Iron Fist. He's a dopey white kid who can like barely fight. And he's like talking like a goofball to all these people. That's not Finn Jones's fault. He looks the part. He had a bad script. No prep time. And they pushed this on. They pushed that show way too quickly into something stupid. And then when, Def do you guys remember Defenders? When Defenders happened and nobody talked about it? And they're just like, well, what if Iron Fist was like the stupid child of that universe? And like briefly, when we're going on later into the shows, we have season two of like what Luke Cage and we have season two of Iron Fist. And then we have like those characters. We have Finn Jones and Mike Coulter team up and we're like, this is what we've wanted the whole time. And it's like, why didn't we just do this from the beginning? Why don't we just do Heroes for Hire from the beginning? Because the character, Finn Jones, clearly worked best when he was playing off of Mike Coulter and not with Charlie Cox and not with Kristen Ritter. When he was just the two of them, they found their footing and it worked and we should do that more. So the cultural, de the cultural depiction of Iron Fist was he's a goofy guy that nobody really likes. But... Because of that, Marvel Comics was like, we're just going to like change things over here for a minute. So now we're going to do the thing that everybody thought we should have done from the beginning and just change it to make him an Asian character. And th okay, the thing is, yes, there is like the redundancy that comes with it because we also have Shang-Chi. But they, they serve two different purposes. And the thing is, like, if you want to get technical about it and really talk about, like, what things focus on, especially, like, in the era, Shang-Chi comics of, like, the early era were, like, he's an international spy guy. And he's doing, like, all these cool martial arts across the world and fight, like, these big threats. And his, his dad's a stereotyped villain who's, like, this big threat. And then with Danny, it's, like, he's on the street. He's fighting, like, gangs and stuff. There was a huge difference between the two of them. Shang-Chi just had kung fu danny had the mysticism now what the shang chi movie did was give shang the mysticism which could literally render danny catatonic in that universe where it's like what are we even attempting with him there's nothing more we could say or do that's unique or interesting but there still is there's still stuff to try so i do kind of want to like go through some of like the key moments of what happened with danny Rand, things that i like where i think you should start I will always say there are so many cool stuff to talk about like in that Heroes for Hire era. It's not as like nuanced or well done as like when we had Green Lantern and Green Arrow team up for like the hard traveling hero stuff. But it does have that vibe where it's like you have these two guys who are clearly different. They can team up together and do something kind of special and it finds their place. It makes them happy. It definitely has like this aesthetic that they can play with. 
And that is something that has been with the characters for so long because both of them were part of like failing books. You team them up, they become instant partners. It works really well. You might not know this if you're new to Iron Fist, but the Wolverine villain Sabretooth first debuted in an Iron Fist comic. So that's something to note. And that has been like the standard for the characters for a while. They've kind of grown, they kind of shifted, blah, blah, blah. They joined the Avengers because Luke Cage was on the new Avengers for a bit. As the story progressed, Danny showed up, which which I think was my introduction to Danny. Because I remember like Bendis' new Avengers was like the first comic book I really read for Marvel where I was like, I'm reading every issue of this bitch. Like, this is my thing. And when Danny showed up, I'm like, who is this interesting fella wearing a big stupid mask who is just having a good time? And he just looks like a badass dude. And I just instantly gravitated to that. I'm like, oh, he is like every, he's like the opposite of both Shang-Chi and Daredevil, where Daredevil is stoic and he is quiet and he has this like internal guilt inside him. And Danny's like, I'm doing the right thing. That's all I know. And Shang-Chi is just like, this is like the most powerful thing about me. But, you know, Danny doesn't have that energy to him. So he's on the new Avengers for a bit, and it's pretty exciting. Then there was like the Civil War stuff where Matt's identity was revealed, and we see that Danny took on the Daredevil persona for a bit, which is kind of fun. Did his own thing there. It was kind of interesting. He was, was he a huge deal? He was kind of a huge deal in Avengers versus X Men, too, because I oh, remember that era. Do you guys remember that? I, I mean, should I do like Marvel events is like an, yeah, I think we'll do Marvel events as like an, a topic later, but there was like that. We got to go to Kun Lung for a minute. Like Kun Lung finally like became a place to go and it was awesome. And, and something actually happened there. But I think the most iconic run and like the most important thing to ever happen to the Iron Fist character was the Immortal Iron Fist run by Brew Baker and Fraction. Like, that was the run that really solidified, like, this is how you tell a modern Iron Fist story. It ran for, I think, a couple years. Was it like, it was started in 2006. I remember that. And it did end, I think, like, 2009, 2010, around there. It was just a really fascinating, cool, creative idea. Where it was like the first time, I think it's in the history of the character. So at that point, it, it would have been like 30 years of Iron Fist that somebody really said, what if we delved into like the world that he is a part of? What if we took like the, the character, his entire world, and we showed you that he is not the only thing a part of this? Because this is the story where we are introduced to the previous Iron Fist, where we start to see there's a larger mythos here, where it's like a title passed down from the beginning of time, and that's expanded on later when like the first person of Kun Lung becomes like that. And then we also learn about the capital cities of heaven, and we get to play with a bunch of other characters like the Prince of Orphans, the the Bride of Nine Spiders, and Fat Cobra, and Mother, Crane Mother, and it's like these are cool concepts that we love to see, that we have so much fun with, and they just, it's it's a good looking book. The best way to describe it is, is like. I'm sure everybody here has read My Life as a Weapon, which is like the Fraction and Aja Hawkeye run. It is like that, but for Iron Fist. It tried so hard. It gave him something to do. And it was so beautiful. And, and it's such a good story to expand the mythos, giving us all the characters of Kun Lung, all the characters of the other cities, showing you that this is a guy that can survive on his own. He can hold his own ground. And even through all of that, when we are introduced to other characters of different ethnicities, Danny is still like the cool, calm surfer guy. Like, hey, if this is a tournament, I'll fight the best I can. Yeah, he's so chill about it. And we just love him for it. That is a really good era of Danny, a really good era of Iron Fist and something I think a lot of people would like. Between that there's not really much that happens from there to where he's going to go with heart of the dragon. It's really just kind of like, Oh, he's going to appear on this team. Oh, he's going to do this thing. There's a couple of books like Brisson had a book, which was kind of fun. I have just been rereading because I picked up the trade of it. The 
Power Man and Iron Fist book from David F. Walker, which is such a such a good portrayal of those characters. That's the kind of thing where I'm like, if this had staying power, it would be like a top tier book at Marvel because that issue, that book is so fun. It's these two guys who have been through enough separately coming back together, like Danny the whole time being this is a comeback. We're a team again. It's all great. Luke, like I don't have time for this. I have a wife and kid. I don't want to deal with you now. Please don't make me be a part of this. But it's such a fantastic read. I guess in between that two, he does meet Pei. And if you aren't familiar with Pei, do you remember that era of Marvel where every character was like, we need a younger version of ourselves because if we ever do a movie, these characters can't be them forever. You know, we have to get a younger version. So we had Pei who was just like, she's going to inherit the power one day. She was part of the the Living Weapon, which is another really fun book. If you haven't read Iron Fist, The Living Weapon, it is such a strong, such a creative and unique, different book. She was just like, she she had the egg, right? Like she had the egg of the last incarnation of Shao Lao, and then one day she was like, just got the power. It's pretty fun. Cool character. She's a really fun character. And the thing where it's like, yeah, you didn't really need to give Lun, like, Lun, Lin Lai the power. You could have just given it to Pei and have Iron Fist become, like, the supporting mentor role. And it, it's fine. You know, I don't think the Lin Lai stuff is going to stick forever. It will eventually go back to the way things are because comic books are, you know, incestuous that way. It'll always go back to where it's from. But it's kind of cool, like... The, the modern era, there is always a writer willing to try something with Iron Fist. And when we get to Heart of the Dragon, that's where it's like, okay, now it's time to talk about the things people have been complaining about online forever. And it happens. It happens. And I'm fine with it. The thing is, he will always be a character that matters to me. Because he is still like my niche little baby that is specifically made for me. He's got the surfer dude, powerful white guy vibes of just like, I'm always going to do the right thing. I know where my money's got to go. If I have to work in a soup kitchen, I'm going to hand like a dollar bill to a homeless person. He just knows the right thing. He has a really cool costume. He has a really cool backstory. Like he punches a dragon's heart out. He's part of a mystical city. He's pretty much been on every team imaginable. And he's got connections to almost every single person in the Marvel Universe. He is just a really strong character that they're afraid to push now. They are afraid to take the chance because some backlash might come out from it. And and look, I get it, Marvel. It is scary when people criticize you for making a stand. But you make so many terrible stands to begin with. You killed off Kamala Khan in a leak. And it's so ridiculous. But there is just so many things you could be doing right. And so many things you're afraid to try. But if you really wanted to do it, look... I'm not saying Danny is a character you have to push right now, but if you wanted to tell a good Danny Rand story, you make him the mentor, you give him the Thunderer role, a Kunlung, like he is training the new generation of kids. You give him like a Strange Academy role where he becomes Jericho, where Jericho is like the teacher for all these magical kids. Do that for him in Kunlung. Have him reestablish the heroes for hire. Have him get back together with Misty Knight. What's she doing right now? That's another thing I just love is like we kept all of those creations, Luke Cage, Iron Fist, Shang-Chi, Colleen Wing, Misty Knight. We kept them all in like a familiar bubble of like knowing each other. They're all like on the same level because they're all like those 90s nostalgic black exploitation, Kung Flu exploitation creations. And they just all connect so well. And Danny and Misty is so much fun and it's so interesting and something that should be explored more. But Danny is just a big, goofy kid. He is having the time of his life all the time. And we appreciate him for it. And it works well. And it's enjoyable. And I want to see more from him. And if we never get it, I can live with it. I have years and years of stuff for that character. And he does have a fitting end to letting the torch be passed to the next generation. Regardless of whether they want it or not. Also... If we don't see him again in the movies, that's fine. But if we do, if we do see Danny Rand again and we have everybody from the Netflix shows come back except Finn Jones, Highway Robbery, he deserves, deserves another shot at this. 
He is not the problem with that show. What they asked him to do, what they were telling him to do, that was the problem. He did absolutely fine and deserves more because he looks, feels, acts, and is the part of Iron Fist. And this character will always be special to me, always be important to me. If I could leave you with one thing, it's this quote from the Iron Fist himself on the Wikipedia, not Wikipedia, the Marvel fandom wiki. I am the Iron Fist. I hold back the storm when nothing else can. Badass, like a, a fire dragon guy. Like, come on. It's just cool shit. And we love to see it. So do you want some recommendations for Iron Fist? I, I feel like we could do that. There's a lot of epic collections of Power Man and Iron Fist that you could read. The Heroes for Hire era. It's all really good stuff. I think from the 70s, 80s, and 90s, there is something to explore in every single one of those eras. And then from there, I would say go to the Immortal Iron Fist from Brubaker, Fraction, and Aja. It's a really good run that looks great, is so well executed, and gives the character more depth and meaning. From there, you have the Iron Fist, the Living Weapon book, which introduces Pei, and she's such a cool character. From there, I say you go to Power Man and Iron Fist by David F. Walker, which is a really fun book. And then jump over to Heart of the Dragon. Fantastic short story. And then if you want to read the current Iron Fist stuff with Lin Lai, there's something in there that's really intriguing. All really cool stuff. All really cool stuff. So, that's going to do it for this episode of The Geek Wave. Be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. As always, you can check me out on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. And as always, I will catch you in the next one. Have fun. Stay safe. Good luck.